All right, here we are again. In the final portion of the lecture for today, I would like to discuss uh, LRFD versus ASD design. So maybe that you maybe remember that from structural analysis, maybe remember that from other courses. But uh, if you don't, we'll remind us here. All right. So uh, first, let's do a review of the more basic form of uh, of uh, safety and safety design. Okay, so before we even do that, why do we need safety? Why do we need factors of safety? Why do we need to look at allowable stress, etc.? Or why do we need to use load factors, resistance factors, etc.? Okay, so obviously uh, you don't want to design your structure for uh, the bare minimum, or in the sense that if you predict that your structure will face a live load of a uh, thousand pounds in a particular location, you don't want to design that structure for exactly 1,000 pounds because there's always uncertainty. What if you uh, underestimated the load? You may have estimated that, that in the location it would be 1,000 pounds, but one day it ends up being actually 1,100 pounds. Or maybe you underestimated your strength. Maybe your uh, maybe uh, there's a manufacturing defect. Maybe uh, you get a steel girder in and it's actually you don't realize at the time, but there's a small defect in one location and it's not quite as strong as you needed it to be. And if you design that thing for it to stand exactly 1,000 pounds and any bit over that, it's going to collapse or going to fail anyway. Failure doesn't, of course, uh, necessarily mean collapse. Uh, you're not going to be in a good place. So uh, there is always uncertainty and we need to take that into account. And really, there are two ways to do this. Uh, the more basic one is the factor of safety. So let's discuss the factor of safety approach. Let's do some review of the factor of safety. Okay, so let us say we have a, a, a load and a resistance. And let's use that thousand pound example again. But let's make it something simple, like uh, we could use these principles for really any kind of design. And let's say we're just talking about something very simple, like a table. If we have a table wonderfully drawn table. And this table must resist a load, a downward vertical load of 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. So, well, what is the load? Well, the load is 1,000 pounds. Fairly straightforward, and I, that was given. Um, so the resistance, well, the resistance is simply going to be how strong is the table? The resistance is whatever the table is capable of resisting. Now we're going to need um, some sort of resistance and some sort of uh, some sort of uh, we're going to need some sort of resistance in order to carry this load. And I'm going to use for now, I'll use the variable um, P for my load and R for my resistance P because it's a point load. Now, in all cases, I need P to be less than R. The moment P is greater than R, then I have a problem. Uh, and so I have two effective ways of do, okay, take, taking into account uncertainty, though. Um, let's consider this. Again, each based around the idea of P being less than R. Here. So P is less than R, P is less than R. Now, I, uh, I do want to use the idea of factors. I want to demonstrate factor of safety here. So let's see where we would apply this. Well, one approach is to actually just increase our loads. So if we were using a factor of safety of 1.2, we could just multiply our loads, say it'll make the loads 20% higher, and that will be a way we'll use a single number to take into account uncertainties in both load and resistance. Alternately, mathematically, of course, the same thing, we could decrease our resistance. So multiplying the load and, and uh, dividing the resistance, multiplying the load by 1.2 and dividing the resistance by 1.2, you can clearly see this is just a very simple equation. These are the exact same thing. Uh, so this is the kind of approach that I teach in mechanics and materials. So in mechanics and materials, you're learning very basic concepts of tension and compression. Uh, you're right after statics, uh, maybe after dynamics, but you're, uh, it's your first exposure to material properties, or at least mechanical material properties. And uh, maybe, although you sometimes say a bit of that in physics, but uh, it's your first exposure to uh, mechanics and materials, mechanical uh, properties of uh, steel and other things. 
And uh, we keep things simple. We, I, I usually keep things simple and just uh, stay strictly to factors of safety. Uh, we don't need to worry about anything too complex. We just apply a single number to the thing and call it good. But is there a better way? Now, for most of the history of engineering, this is actually what we used. Uh, if you were practicing engineering uh, really up until the 1970s, 1980s, you're going to be using a factor of safety approach. It was, uh, it was developed, you know, it was a... Uh, the factor of safety approach is very old. It comes from, you know, uh, people have been using it for, well, at least for the whole hist modern history of engineering, anything that we would call engineering. Uh, you know, obviously the, the craft of building goes back centuries, but engineering uh, has a bit shorter history depending on when you want to define the history of engineering, two, three centuries, depending on your uh, exact definition when you call the start of engineering, what you define as the cutoff line. But anyway, um, Especially in early times when we didn't have a lot of studies, like statistical studies, uh, when we haven't, hadn't studied engineering as a real uh, scientific field uh, very much, we didn't have a lot of data on uh, specifically on what the exact variability for types of loads are. We didn't have a lot of statistical evidence on the variation in, say, uh, the, how variable a given steel beam will be in its resistance. So. Um, we tended to just use a single factor of safety. It, it made sense, it was nice and conservative. We would just say, we know the real world is complicated. We, may, we, we know we may be either overestimating our resistance or underestimating our load. So we're just gonna say factor of safety of two if we're really conservative, or a factor of safety of 1.5, or, <coughs> excuse me. You might even use a factor of safety dependent, they might have even used a factor of safety dependent on the purpose of the building. Like if it's a, <coughs> If it was a building that was just meant to carry, you know, like tools or something like that, if it was just like a shed or something, you might just use a factor of safety of one, if it, or maybe even less than one. If it was a very critical building, like a hospital or something, you'd, you you might use a factor of safety really high, like two. Uh, but your factor of safety would simply depend on whatever your application was. It, it wasn't actually dependent on the very specifics of what type of load you were looking at or what type of uh, structure you had. You just used a basic factor of safety. But uh, as we've learned more about the world and we've learned more about the variability in things, we've started to look at a better way. And so why do we need a better, a better way? Well, let's look at this. Is there a better way? And it turns out that yes, there is. It's LRFD design. And so we'll ask two questions. We're gonna start by asking two questions. First, what do we know about the load? What exactly do we know about the load? Second, what do we know about uh, resistance? Or in other words, what, we do, what do we know about P? Second, what do we know about resistance, R? That's a T, wow. Uh, what do we know, exa what exactly do we know about the resistance, R? What do we know about these things? So we're gonna split these up based on knowledge. So we are gonna break the factor of safety apart into two different factors um, based on knowledge. For example, um, when I say knowledge, uh, we know, for example, a, a, good, a good way to see this is um, a really good example of this is, well, actually, let me, let me label this out, and first I will, uh, then I'll give some examples of this. So we're going to break things up. We'll have a, um, a P ultimate, or actually first we'll have a gamma I. This would be, a, effect, uh, it's effectively a factor of safety just for the load, but we'll call this a load factor. And we'll also have our PN, our P nominal. Our PN, our P nominal. Um, so this is our, we have our uh, load factor. It will be a multiplier. It will increase the load. And so this is always going to be greater than one. We're never going to be decreasing the load. We're always going to be increasing load. And the not the and PN is the nominal uh, load, the unmultiplied load, just what we calculate initially based off of the code, uh, whatnot. This is the nominal load. Then we're going to have phi and r sub n. Phi is going to be a resistance factor. 
Now, if you remember, if you remember mechanics and materials, we used V for angle of twist. That's definitely not what we're looking at here. This is going to be a uh, a resistance factor. So we have our nominal uh, the resistance, R n, R sub n, nominal resistance. And we have our resistance factor, or resistance factors, depending. So uh, let me give some examples of why you wouldn't just put, the, put these together into a single factor of safety. So let's think about this. Depending on the context, you may have very different um, levels of uncertainty to either your load or your um, uh, to either your load or your resistance. So for example, uh, we just came out of a hurricane and lots of flooding, lots of flooding and stuff. Uh, rain load, or at least, in, well, obviously in terms of flooding and rain and wind load are things that come with very, very high uncertainty levels. They, um, you know, at least in the, the flood we just had here, now flooding isn't the same as structural resistances, but in terms of just like level of rain, uh, we had areas that um, got hit by 500 year floods, 1000 year floods, etc. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it only comes every 500 years. We're talking a 500 year flood is a 100 year flood is something that happens on average 1% a year, 500 year flood on the average 0.2% uh, a year, etc. But uh, there was huge variability even across the city of Houston. You know, different areas got 30 inches, some people, some areas got 30 inches, some got less than 30, some got 50 and over. There's a lot of variability. So, or uh, at least the, so the maximum loads that something may encounter at a given time, uh, or even over its entire lifetime, in terms of rain and wind load, is highly variable. Uh, consider instead something like, uh, uh, something like dead load, or something like self-weight would be a great example. Uh, self-weight is pretty well known. You know what you're going to be putting in a building. You know what members are going to be putting in a building. You know what kind of beams, you know what kind of columns, you know what kind of floor slab. Now, there is some variability. So, uh, for example, if you design your self-weight and you don't use any effect or safety on that or any, not, any uh, load factor on your self-weight, that wouldn't be ideal because, for example, what happens if you're assuming, you know, six-inch uh, thick floor slabs and the contractor screws up a little bit and puts in six-and-a-quarter-inch uh, floor slabs? Uh, probably not going to happen, but it might. Um, but again, it's not going to be substantially. It's there's not as much variability in that kind of load as you would ha have in something like um, a environmental load. Or if you really want to talk about something that has a, ver a high variability, think about something. Now, this is not something we normally design buildings for, but there are some buildings that we actually design for blast load. Things like military buildings, things like uh, uh, certain uh, sometimes police buildings, uh, any kind of government building that they would you know it's. Post 9-11, especially, you know, we, sometimes we do design public buildings for blast loading. Talk about variability. That is, inc there, there are so many variables that go into that, you can't even predict that. Whether a building may stand its entire life without ever having a blast load, most, that's the most likely. And then the amount of blast that a building may, may encounter, if it is subject to that, is so variable that it's almost impossible to predict. But uh, anyway, that's, that's the most extremely variable loading I can think of. Um, and I'm sure there's others someone else could think of. But anyway, what about res what about variability in terms of resistance? Well, um, so that that explains previously on the on the loads why you wouldn't want to use why you might need different load fact or different uh, load factors to account that you so for example on something with a very high variability like uh, your environmental loadings like wind and such you might you probably want to use a higher uh, load factor. Uh, for that particular type of loading uh, than you would for something like self-weight. With self-weight, you might just use 1.1 or 1.05 even. Or, or, now, you usually don't choose these. These are usually prescribed by code, but I'm just trying to give you the idea. Resistance, however, um, can also have some variability. So um, uh, what are some examples? Okay, well, steel, for example. We're, you know, we've talked about types of steel, and uh, A992 steel is going to have a yield stress of 50 KSI. Well, what if you're designing with yield as a limit state and you're counting on 50 KSI? Well, what if one of your beams, uh, the steel isn't quite what it should be and it's not quite up to spec and it gets past the inspectors and it has a yield strength of 48 KSI? 
Now, that's not likely to happen. I mean, especially modern steel, it's pretty well made, and there's a lot of control processes, the quality control processes that QAQC you see that goes into it. But it, there is a chance, not a very large chance, but there is a chance. But steel being a manufactured product, is a fully manufactured product, is not very, does not have a very high variance on it. The standard deviation is fairly small. Everything, uh, this, the, if you say that something has a yield strength, that if you prescribe it, if your spec says steel is def 50 KSI, odds are almost every time it's going to be at least that much, if not higher. Uh, however, uh, there are other construction materials that are going to be a lot more variable. What if you're using wood? What if you're using timber? Now, in this class, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to teach you how to design with timber, but many of the same principles that we use for steel and concrete design, you could design timber with, or design houses and timber structures. Timber is a natural product. It is a, it is literally grown from trees. It's not literally made of trees. It's an it's a organism that grows in the ground. And because of that, it's not manufactured. It is, it is a living, breathing organism while it's alive. So of course, there's all sorts of variations in there. Yes, you can... Uh, design and do some mechanical tests on it to figure out what the, the properties are, but there is going to be, there, but intrinsically, there's going to be way, way more variation in uh, lumber than there would in steel. Uh, and concrete, on average, is probably going to have merit, more variability than steel will as well. Yes, the uh, ability to design concrete mixes is quite advanced, and we can do some pretty good things with those, um, but uh, Again, with concrete, you're using um, minerals and aggregate that you dig out of the earth. There is intrinsically more variation in that than in a product that is formed from a molten metal where you can... The nice thing about steel is you exactly control the chemistry. It's not like it's not like with concrete that we take, you know, rock and... If, we wanted, if you wanted to make concrete as precisely as we do steel, you'd have to take rock and grind it up and literally heat it up to the point of being molten and you know, exactly control the chemistry, basically make artificial lava and cool it and then get the exact precise mineral and rock content that you want. We could do that. I mean, that should, that is theoretically possible, but it would kind of eliminate the main benefit of concrete, which is that it's cheap. So if we're, you know, if we're going to go to the trouble of, you know, heating up immense amounts of things in a furnace, we might as well just make steel. Um, but anyway, so concrete tends to have more variability than steel does. So the point of all this rambling is that uh, different loads and different types of resistances are going to have different types of loads and different kinds of resistances are going to have a uh, different variability. And as such, you don't necessarily just want to use one factor of safety for your whole structure. You don't want to necessarily use the same factor of safety every time you design a column in all structures. Uh, really, the exact factor of safety you want is some sort of combination of the variability on your loads and the variability on your resistances. And that is where LRFD comes from. LRFD is load and resistance factor design. Oh, and resistance factors, uh, I didn't mention this, but all of these would be less than one. So this is where LRFD, load resistance factor design comes in. LRFD. And this is the more modern approach. Now, uh, people, you know, since uh, probably at least over 100 years have realized that there are, you know, variations in variability. And if I can explain it to you right here, you know, any intelligent person with some, with some background in engineering could realize, you know, even in, even in the early 20th century, late 19th century, that this kind of pattern did exist. Um, but if you really want to do this as a code, prescribe this kind of thing in a code, you need to have a lot of scientific evidence. You before, yes, you can, yes, I can say intuitively that concrete must be more, that or concrete or timber are probably more variable than steel, but uh, in order to actually create a code, it's that's not good enough. I need to say, not only do I have a vague feeling or common sense that wood is more variable than steel, but I need to be able to say, I, you know, we have evidence from a hundred laboratory studies, we have this vast body of knowledge, and we can statistically document that yes, um, this is more variable. Not just is it more variable, but it's this much more variable. So when you see a factor of safety, or, sorry, when you see a resistance factor uh, outlined in say the steel manual or the concrete manual, that comes directly from uh, many, many decades, many years of uh, 
many years of uh, laboratory uh, analysis. So you're basically, especially in the, the steel manner or the concrete code, what you are, you know, when you get your code, if you don't have it yet, just go through the references. That, that's always a treat. Go through the references. Just look through, go look at the acknowledgments. See the literally thousands of references and hundreds of acknowledgments. They're all, almost all of them, with some exceptions, are, you know, various university researchers down the line. Some have been dead for decades, but, um, they're all uh, people who have researched some area of um, structural engineering. They've looked at different materials, different connection, different types of connections, all sorts of different things. Now, um, some things uh, in mind. Let's see what else. Um, your one other thing about this, of course, uh, I mentioned. I gave some examples of uh, some areas where you might want different resistance factors based on material, but you also might want different resistance factors based off of a uh, type of member or function. So, for example, it might make more sense to have a higher resistance factor on a column than it would on a beam, and maybe more on a girder than you would on a beam. So maybe you want the least factor of safety on a beam because remember, it goes load will go generally from beams to girders to columns. Col girders don't trick don't uh, uh, girders collect load from beams and col and columns collect load from girders uh, more or less depending. But uh, so. Uh, if a single beam fails, yes, that's not great, but it, it doesn't do more than knock out the section of floor, you know, immediately around it, you know, a small little couple foot wide section. Uh, if a uh, girder fails, when you're, you're uh, in a much worse time, because now if that girder fails, multiple uh, um, beams are going to fail. And if a column fails, then multiple girders are going to fail. So that's that's the worst case scenario. So. In many cases, you may uh, want to use a higher factor of safety, or I keep saying factor of safety, I gotta be more precise in my language. I would wanna use a higher resistance factor for my column than I might wanna use it for just a simple beam or, or even a girder. Okay, let's go on to talk about this more in terms of a probabilistic model. So let's, I wanna look at this uh, in terms of probability. So I've already kind of hinted at this, but I want to look at this in terms of probability and normal distributions. And again, everything I'm doing so far is qualitative. We're not, I'm not actually going to ask you to, you know, plot out, you know, some normal distributions and do T tests or, or, uh, uh, or uh, other tests, things like that. We're not going to do that. That's, this isn't a statistics class. Maybe if we were teaching at the graduate level, we would, but I just want you to have some understanding and, uh, exp and uh, experience and respect for how, uh, or appreciation is probably better word than the respect, uh, some appreciation for how the code that you are using, how the codes that you are using function at a statistical level. So let's look at this. Okay, uh, let's look, consider the probabilistic model here. Um, probabilistic model. Okay, so again, this all comes down to, uh, well, if I'm gonna look at this up from an economics point of view almost, uh, demand must be less than or equal to supply. Our supply being our resistance, our demand being our load. Our structure, we put certain demands on it and it must be able to meet that demand. It has to supply some resistance. So um, here, now, um, I'm going to switch away from P. I used P previously because that was a, I was drawing things on a, I was drawing a load on a table and that was a point load. But I want to talk about something more generic and I'm going to use a Q to refer to just a generic load. And sort of the guiding equation here uh, between this probabilistic model is that the sum of gamma I, uh, Q and I, that's an O, but now it's a Q, looks bad, uh, Q and I, Q sub ni must be less than or equal to, well, actually, let me first say this is equal to Q ultimate and must be less than or equal to phi rn. So uh, let's look at this. Let me define each of these things. Phi i, uh, Q ni, and Q u. And then phi, we've discussed this already, 
and Rn. Okay, so let's look at each of these. Colon, colon. And these are, there are i's on here, because basically this is a summation from i equals 1 to n. But anyway, I left off the ends because I have an n here, but that's the basic idea. And I know my u's look like n sometimes, but this is a q u q ultimate. Okay, so let me define all these, and then we'll discuss. So um, q, uh, gamma i here is going to be our load factor for a single load, for a single type of load. Uh, QNI would be your nominal load. Nominal, also known as service load. Nominal load, service load, same thing. And Q ultimate is the ultimate or combined load. So if you remember from structural analysis or from other courses I hope you've seen, if you remember back to the 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, the kind of thing you find in the ASCE manual, the kind of load cases you see in the ASCE manual, the Q ultimate is what you get on the, so first you calculate uh, on a member, the various uh, loads that you're gonna have on it. You could calculate from manually, you could be, they could be given to you, they could come from a structural analysis software package, whatever. You have your individual uh, service loads. Your, by service loads, I mean, on a given member, there is some dead load, there's some live load, there's some rain load, there's some snow load, there's some wind load, etc. Those are your individual service loads. You multiply each of those by their own load factor for that load case. And then when you combine all of those together, uh, you end up with a Q uh, ultimate. Q U Q ultimate. And that's what we're ultimate, that's, it's called ultimate because that's ultimately what we're going to design the member for. We don't design the member multiple times, that's kind of silly. Instead what we do is we uh, work through a variety of load cases, load com combinations, load conditions, and we find the biggest one. Uh, and then we just design for that one. That's a bit of a simplification, that's the basic idea. Then phi of course is going to be our resistance factor. And R is the nominal, uh, the nominal resistance. So again, in essence, what we're doing is we're applying the load combinations we get from the ASC code or from some other code if you're designing something other than regular structures and buildings. Maybe you're using Ashto or something like that, or maybe you're using oh some sort of API uh, manual or something like that if you're doing, um, doing some sort of petroleum structure, whatever kind of load you're working with. Uh, but anyway, these are your load. This, th this summation here is essentially you applying those load combinations and selecting the biggest one. And whatever the biggest load combination you get, that is your QU, that is your Q ultimate. Now, uh, here, let's move on here. So, let's see. Now, let's say we have, um, for, any, for every one of these things, there's going to be, uh, for every one of these loads or for these resistances, there's going to be a certain variability. And uh, I'm going to draw a normal distribution, how I might uh, illustrate this. And phi, or uh, sorry, sigma, uh, as you learned in statistics, we usually use for standard deviation. And beta is your reliability index. Now we don't need to, don't, don't worry too much about this. Again, I just want you to know about this, but uh, you won't be design, we don't usually design using a reliability index. But this is just to give you some appreciation of where the numbers in the code come from. So for a given load or for a given resistance, there is a certain um, bell curve. We estimate, uh, when we do our estimate, we think the uh, load or we think the, uh, we think the resistance is right at this middle line. This doesn't mean zero, we just think it's somewhere, this is the average that we think it's at. However, we don't know. There's always going to be some variability, and maybe that's going to follow, and, and we usually assume that follows a normal distribution with just as many uh, more as less, or less as more. So I'm going to draw a poorly drawn bell curve here. And um, we're going to assume, there, now here's the thing, we're never going to be able to design for everything. So maybe we're going to say there's a certain range that we're, if we're outside of, 
um, well, we're just going to assume it's never going to be there. Like, we're going to assume a certain type of, a certain standard deviation. We're going to say we're going to design it for, we're going to design the structure to be fine 90% of the time, 99% of the time, 99.99% of the time. Um, but there's always going to be some cases that we can't eliminate. So, um, but how, the question is, how far do we go? Well, um, we need to use a, uh, we're going to use uh, something, and we use a, in order to figure out how far we go, we use a formula of beta times sigma. First, we figure out the sigma, the actual um, expected normal distribution, or what kind of, what kind of, sorry, what kind of uh, standard deviation we see in laboratory experiments. But then beta is our uh, reliability index. In other words, uh, what kind of um, um, what kind of uh, member we're looking at, or what kind of uh, element we're looking at. So, for a beta example, beta example, uh, in the case of a live plus dead load, uh, what's baked into some codes is a beta. Now you don't see it when you're applying the code. But what's baked into the code is a beta of 3.0 for members. and 4.5 for connections. So if you're designing a connection, you will, at the end, uh, you will end up using a um, higher, or I suppose a lower, in this case, resistance factor um, for uh, connections than you do for members. Uh, connections. So if we use a higher beta, we are basically using a whole extra standard deviation um, for member for connections 3.0 for members uh, so we would end up going 3.5 or we'd end up going three standard deviations from the expected value for um in other words we would design our members for three standard deviations for, from the expected load while we'll design our um our connections for 4.5 uh, standard deviations from the expected load but again we can't eliminate everything there's always going to be some variability. There's always going to be some uh, element. There's always going to be some chance that we end up with a massive load or a really undervalued resistance. So, um, but we can't control for everything. So, um, basically, again, we control load factors. We control load factors. Uh, phi, or sorry, gamma and phi. Uh, to control probability of failure and give good beta. So basically, we pick a certain beta that we want, and then tweak the uh, phi and the and the gamma to get the beta that we want to make sure that our systems are being designed for a su our sufficient number of standard deviations uh, to control uh, probability of failure and get good beta. Well, uh, control probability of failure and get good and get good beta. and make sure we have a good reliability index beta. Because by doing this, if we ensure that uh, we are always going to be, uh, the structure is not going to fail under a sufficient number of standard deviations, then we know that it's gonna be good 95% of the time, or 98% of the time, or 99% of the time, or 99.99% of the time. You can feed those betas into a normal table if you wanna know the exact percentages. But anyway, the question is, why don't we design our structures to just never fail? I mean, that would seem to be the most logical thing. I don't want my, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want my house to ever fall in. I don't want my house to ever flood. I don't want my, um, I don't want my building that I'm sitting in, you know, teaching class to fall in on me. But unfortunately, the simple truth of it is you can never get 100%. We do not live in a perfect world. We do not live in a, um, we do not live. In, we cannot live in a world of perfect safety. Uh, basically, we can, we have various ways of calculating loadings, but all of these are based on a certain distribution of loading, whatever it is. So, um, you know, for example, I I might design my building uh, to if I would design my if I had to design my house really strong, I may design it to uh, if I want my house to be really strong, I may design it to you know be able to withstand even higher than the winds experienced, sustained winds experienced during a category five hurricane. 
You know, that would be extreme wins, extreme sustained wins. Even I could even design it for the gusts if I wanted. And uh, that, even that would be extremely conservative. But, uh, you know, basically assuming that the worst part of the Category 5 hurricane goes right over uh, my area of Houston. But that's not going to be perfect because, hey, as you may remember from the hurricane, remember all those tornado warnings? What happens if when the hurricane's going over, it spawns this hurricane and an F5 hurricane goes and lands right on top of my house? Well, the chances of that happening are pretty low, but I can't, may, I can't say it's ever going to be zero. I mean, sure, I could design for that, um, but uh, even then we might be able to say, but what if there's some crazy event that, what if two tornadoes hit my house at the same time? Or if we, I designed it for that, what if five tornadoes hit my house at the same time? Or what if when the tornado hits the hurricane winds line up just right? Or, uh, and even if I design it for that, what I can say, what if there is a nuclear blast downtown and there's this immense blast wave coming forward and crazy winds and everything like that? It, Anyway, I can always dream up a, cra a crazier or stronger loading. There is always going to be a higher loading that has some non-zero chance of happening. But really, I mean, I don't see much point, on, honestly, in designing my house to survive a nuclear blast because, honestly, I mean, I probably don't want to live through that. But uh, anyway, let's not worry about such things. But, uh, uh, or even ignoring that, uh, in terms of designing our, our buildings for really crazy load events like that, well... The thing is, yes, we can design buildings for that, but at the end, I don't care what you're using, I don't care that you're using steel or concrete, but at some point, everything just starts resembling a bunker. And if you're applying so much concrete and you're gonna, you're not gonna end up with members so strong and so thick that you might as well just, you know, uh, essentially just, if you're really worrying about winds that strong, you might as well just build a concrete box and cover it with dirt and literally live in a bunker. I mean, at that point, it's gonna be cheaper. So, I mean, literally, or I wouldn't recommend building a bunker by digging in Houston. The water table is going to give that a problem. But at, at some point, if you're literally building your house strong enough for that, you might as well just build a great big concrete box of a structure, cover it in five feet of dirt, and just live in a hobbit hole or something. Because if you're designing for that kind of, if you're designing for million-year wind events, ugh, your, your building is going to resemble a bunker at that point. And it, there's just no point. I mean, you can do that if you want, and you know what, if you have all the money in the world, I'm sure, you know, you can find some contractor and some structural engineer who'll have great fun building your crazy house for you, but if you're a structural engineer designing houses for people, unless they have a lot of money and specifically ask for the crazy bunker house, um, I don't think uh, you're going to stay in business very long if everyone tries to buy a house from you and you insist on only building bunker houses. You may tell people that, hey, I can guarantee you that you this, and oh, also if we're talking about flood design, not only is it, you know, designed for the five year flood, but it's designed for the million year flood. And it is like, you know, raised 50 feet above the street level or something. It's on concrete pillars 50 feet high or some, you can see this thing from several miles away. And everyone knows you as the, the paranoid person who lives in the crazy 50 foot high house. But uh, anyway, that's fun to think about, but okay, let's finish this up. So again, talk. I want to give some um, discussions of each of these and final notes, and then finish up with the discussion of the probabilistic model. So sorry, I, get, I have a little fun when talking about this. Uh, so load factors. So again, oh, and also I'll mention resistance factors. So again, load factors account for uncertainty in loads. It's kind of self-explanatory. As we've discussed, this is sort of a summary. Uncertainty in loads. In loads. And uh, nearly always greater than one. There may be some cases where you can use load factors less than one. Uh, again, for things like uh, if you have a building that's not very important that people are hardly ever in, and by important I don't necessarily mean in terms of econ in terms of cost or economics, uh, mainly in terms of things that people just don't spend much time in. I think of uh, industrial storage buildings, uh, that kind of thing, or uh, self storage lots, etc. Uh, always uh, greater than one. Uh, this is also why uh, you know sometimes you. 
um, hear people, not, not very frequently, but um, sometimes you hear people get the brilliant idea, you know, hey, I'm not, li you know, I'm tired of paying rent in an apartment building and I have no standards. Um, you know what, I'm shameless, I don't care. I'm just gonna go live in one of those uh, self-storage units, you know, one of those uh, uh, UPAC places. Um, you know, the, especially the, uh, you'd wanna get one of the, you know, air conditioned ones, the, the climate controlled ones in Houston, I'm sure. But you might figure, hey, I'll just go live in one of those. I'm just gonna um, live there. I'll charge my battery some, my, I'll have a cell phone that I charge the battery on campus somewhere. I'll, you know, shower at the, you know, the gym or something. And I'll just save a whole bunch of money by living at the, uh, the self-storage unit. Well, um, uh, for one, uh, I hope you don't, uh, that's, of course, in the least of every one of those things that you don't, that you are not allowed to do that. And it's not allowed for a very good reason. Uh, those buildings are not uh, certified for human habitation. And the reason is, is that they're not designed for it. Uh, they're designed with safety factor, they're typically designed with safety factors less than one. You're actually allowed to decrease the loads that you calculate that you apply to those things. There's a reason those things are built so lightly. They're built so lightly because they don't have to be uh, accor built according to the same code or the same, I don't want to say codes, it's too generic. They don't have to be built to the same load factors as you would another building of equivalent size. Also, they don't have any emergency stairwells in them. They have, might have some, but they don't have the same level of emergency stairwell you would have in other buildings of the same size. So there's definitely stairwells. They're not super reinforced, you know, fire rated emergency stairwells. Oh, and then more, more important. So if there is a fire and you're in your, you know, storage unit apartment, uh, there may not be a stairwell for you to get out of. Or more importantly, every, every uh, apartment that you rent out is required to have two means of egress both the front door and at least one window that you can get out of. If there is a apartment, if there's a fire in your apartment and you, uh, or if there's a fire in an apartment building and you walk out and you see that there is a fire out front of your door, you can always go out your window. Um, or you can stand by the window and yell for help through the fire department. Uh, if you're in your self storage unit apartment when there is a fire and there is fire in front of your door, you are SOL, you are done. Um, also, um, uh, in a apartment, uh, the fire department will go and uh, be happily, well not happily, but they will go through if they can safely um, to themselves, that would, safely being a relative term, um, and safe by firefighter standards, uh, they will go room by room in apartment buildings and clear people out. If you are in your apartment building, or if you're in your apartment building, you're a, your a storage unit apartment, uh, you know, staying there without the knowledge of management. If there is a fire, there is no one coming to get you. They, by, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, fire department will come there and maybe spray some water on the building from the outside. And, you know, they'll uh, they'll say they'll, the storage locker uh, owner will be there and maybe a little sad at the lost profit and such. But the fire marshal will be there saying, oh, well, such is life. You can at least get insurance on it. At least there was nobody inside. They're not coming to get you. But uh, anyway, that uh, has very little to do with structural analysis and structural design, except for the point of view of, um, except from the point of view of um, factors of safety and load factors. But anyway, a little bit of an aside. And again, resistance factors account for uncertainties and resistance. But let's give some examples of this. Account for, uh, for uncertainties in Uh, let's see, uh, member dimensions. So maybe you design something one way and maybe design it so you wrote down that it should be three and a quarter inches, it only ends up being three eighths of an inch. Well, that would be pretty, that would be pretty extreme, but um, anyway, I hope we don't get anything quite that bad. Um, but things like member dimensions. You asked for a 10 inch deep beam, you got, a, you got an eight inch deep beam, that kind of thing. Well, that would be hard to miss. Um, uh, also member properties or material properties. Uh, theory. Theory? What does that mean? Well, uh, you may make certain, again, like everything in engineering, we make certain assumptions, we have certain models. So for example, you may be designing your structure assuming pin joints. You may be assuming that every uh, joint you're only connecting with shear tabs or something. You're assuming that it's just a pin joint, that the joints themselves don't carry any um, resist or any moment. They may carry shear, but no moment. 
there's no such thing as a true pin joint. Even if you only connect the now, when we can, when we say a pin joint, we're usually talking about something that uh, where you're only connecting the web of a say a W section or wide plane shape. But uh, there, even then, if you if you have more more than one bolt or even just one bolt, there's going to be some non-zero moment capacity, and that's going to result in a slightly different distribution of loads than you would otherwise have. And if you did it right as a structural engineer, the difference is small, you know, one or two percent. But it that is one of the fact one of the reasons we have resistance factors is to, to account for imperfections in the theory. We we have to make certain assumptions when we design a structure. And inevitably, some of those assumptions aren't 100% correct. Not because we made the wrong assumptions, but just because no assumption is 100% accurate. And also modeling. Again, we create a model, we think it's right, uh, but again, no model is 100% accurate. So, uh, you know, if we think about, when I say no model is 100% accurate, if you want to, we could start talking about really trivial things. Like, for example, uh, you will never find a structural engineer in the world who worries about the self-weight of the members. Hmm, that doesn't sound right. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, of course, every uh, structural engineer takes into account the weight of the members. That makes sense. When we say self-weight, that's what we mean. Uh, we mean when we say self-weight, we mean the gravity of the member, the force of gravity pulling uh, the member, uh, the earth pulling the member. But if you remember your physics, there is some tiny, 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 uh, every, all matter in the universe is attracted to all other matter. So, uh, if I have one column next to another column, uh, theoretically there should be a tiny bit of gravity between the two members. Now it's so small as to be negligible, but we're going to assume that, you know, in every case, you will never uh, find a structural engineer actually bothering to calculate the mutual gravity between two columns next to each other. But you realize that that is actually not zero. And in certain cases that would actually ever so slightly increase the loads in your members. And that's just, that's a bit of a trivial example. Um, but we could deal with different things like that, you, or we could start talking about variations in the gravitational constant depending on where you are on your surface, but those are variations in modeling. Now, some variations in modeling aren't as trivial as those. Uh, more, uh, less trivial ones would be things like you're assuming rigid diaphragm action when every, when, when no diaphragm is perfectly rigid, everything's going to deform slightly, um, etc. But what are these factors not meant to take into account? This is important to take to consider. These are the kinds of things that no factor, however large, can ever uh, fix. Errors is the first one. Primarily errors on the part of the structural engineer or major errors on the part of the fabricator. So if there are very slight, they're they're meant to carry take they're meant to um, they are meant to account for slight things in fabrication. Like if you know you're building a built-up section and you end up making something a little bit shorter than it needs to be, or a little bit longer than it needs to be, that kind of thing. A factor of safety, no matter how large, is not going to save you, or, or, or a resistance factor is not gonna save you, however large or small, if you use a W6 when you should have used W12. That is, the, 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 uh, those type of errors can happen, but it doesn't matter how uh, large a factor of safety or how small a resistance factor you use, there is nothing that's going to save you from that or major errors on the part of a structural engineer. As a structural engineer, you are responsible for your work. If you screw that up, if you carry the one wrong or you carry the two wrong, if you do the math wrong, if you do the modeling fundamentally wrong, if you don't do this right, uh, your resistance factors in the code are assuming you do everything right, you do your job properly. No amount of, uh, no amount of probabilistic modeling can solve you, can protect you from your own ignorance. You are ultimately responsible for that. No, because the uh, ability of people, so the variations in loads is effectively finite. There are, or predictable. The amount of errors people can make are infinite. Uh, you know, you can make an error and just, uh, people can make, the amount of load, uh, amount of errors or the size of errors that people can make are infinite. You can, you might see someone just forget to take into account self-weight. I just assume this concrete is weightless. Why not? Derp, uh, anyway. Uh, that's, uh, you're not going to be able to have a factor of safety that can resolve that. Or, you know, I'm going to assume, I screw up and uh, I assume it never gets very windy in Houston. Uh, never heard of a hurricane before. Oops. 
uh, there is no amount of uh, load factor that's going to save me if I forgot that hurricanes happen in Houston or in Florida for that matter. So, etc. cetera. Uh, what else? Negligence. Just gross negligence. I am a... Uh, I am a civil engineer who doesn't know anything about turbine design, but it, but you know what? I'm, I'm desperate for work, and I say, sure, why not? I'll go ahead and design a turbine for you. Or, you know, I only have training in uh, water resources engineering. I'm really great at designing a uh, septic plant for you, a, uh, a uh, water treatment plant for you. But, you know, work is short, so I'm going to go be a structural engineer and design a high-rise. I'm going to, you know, why not? I have, a, I have a stamp. I have a PE. I'm gonna design for you a hundred-story building. I think this can't stuff can't be that hard, can it? I'll just use a fa factory safety of two. That should be enough, right? Ugh, negligence. Don't practice outside your area of expertise. That's a kind of a stupid example. That's not and something that dramatic is not gonna happen. But other areas of expertise, or other areas of negligence can happen as well. People just failing to properly inspect things. People pa failing to do proper quality control. Laziness, etc. Or of course, beyond all of this. Now this is the one that occurs the least of all, but malice. If someone is deliberately trying to sabotage a structure during during its construction, obviously no load factor or resistance factor in the world is going to save you if, they, if either a designer, an engineer, or a fabricator, or, or, or a construction worker is deliberately trying to cause a building to fail or collapse, uh, assuming they're not caught, etc. if people aren't checking their work, you're not going to ever be able to completely prevent uh, or protect against something as dramatic as pure willful malice. But that doesn't happen that often. Um, as a structural engineer, you'd have to be a very uh, special type of sociopath to deliberately screw up a structure. Who would do that? I mean, uh, to deliberately, because it, when it fails, it's going to fail at some random time. It may be 20 years after you're dead or something. Who would, del even if you were just mad at the world, I mean, anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's not worry about such things. It, it, it's very rare to actually see. I've never heard of such a case, but I'm sure it's happened at some point in the world. But uh, you tend when failures do happen, they tend to be either toward from uh, errors or negligence. But um, again, uh, resistance and load factors won't protect protect you from malice if that ever did happen. Finally, I do just want to give uh, some uh, b a bit of a highlight to how these probabilistic models work together. And this will be the final note of the lecture. Uh, model. Sorry, I've, I've been uh, expounding on things a little bit, going off on a few tangents, but that's okay. Uh, probabilistic model continued. So, as I mentioned, both the load and the resistance are going to have a certain distribution. And usually we assume it's some sort of normal distribution. And maybe I have Q or R here. And then maybe I plot frequency, the, the occurrence of this level of load or how frequently or, or according to what probability um, that resistance is su successfully deployed. So um, maybe I have my Q, my load, uh, would be a certain, um, would be a certain, um, I would have a certain load distribution. So something like this, certain normal distribution here. And in almost all cases, your uh, your load is going to be less than your um, resistance. So I'm going to draw this to the left. So Q uh, load. So my load uh, follows a certain distribution. And then my R is going to have its own bell curve. And it's going to go something like this. So there's some variance in my resistance. You know, I don't, I, when I design a structure or building, I don't know exactly how much resistance that thing, thing can take. I can estimate the loads uh, based on the best, knowledge, best engineering knowledge available. I can apply the ASCE codes, etc. But I can never exactly know what the true resistance of the building is. The only way I can actually know the resistance of the building, if I want to know the absolute maximum true resistance of the building, uh, say to wind, the only way I can actually test that or to really know that is somehow artificially loaded up with a, a huge amount of wind via some gigantic fan or something and load it until it fails or it collapse either it either a member yields or it collapses or something that's the only way i can actually know it's true resistance uh or if it's a vertical loading i would just have to stack the thing with lead blocks until the thing finally caves in on itself 
Uh, but then that wouldn't tell me how uh, buildings are not mass-produced items, so all I, I wouldn't actually know anything. I, I still wouldn't know the exact value. In other words, like if even if I tried to build another building exactly like that, I wouldn't have that new building would not have the exact same resistance as the old building. There would still be some variability. So uh, obviously, we don't build buildings and then. Uh, knock them over and then try to build the same one again and we could and you could if and you could do that if you had all the money in the world But we tend not to do that We tend not to use prototyping uh, full-scale prototyping for buildings that isn't usually something we do so anyway uh, there's certain so that the long and short of this is that you have a certain distribution for load and a certain distribution for resistance in almost all cases you're fine as long as your load is less than your resistance you're gonna be good. So anywhere in this range, so for anywhere in this range, anywhere over here, you're good. Anywhere over here, you're good. Where you get failure is in this overlapping zone. This zone right here. This is failure. Where your load, where you ultimately get failure usually, or where you can only get failure, uh, well, I guess if you, you could have a long tail here and the, and the load could be, be very, very high, but almost in all cases where your resistance happens, or sorry, where your failure happens is where you get the bad combination of your resistance being less than you expect. Because remember, um, what we expect is, uh, let me draw this here. Maybe I can label this. This would be your Q expected, the expected loading. And here, in the middle of the bell curve for resistance, and I'll draw that in green for consistency, this would be your expected resistance. But, in some cases, your load that your structure experiences over its life is less than what you expect. That's not going to be a problem. Uh, in some cases, your resistance is going to be greater than what you expect. And, on, and in almost all cases with that, you're going to be fine. Uh, however, in some cases, the load is greater than you expect and the resistance is, is going to be less than you expected. Now, again, in even most of those cases, in the vast majority of those cases, you're still going to be fine. However, in some critical cases where your resistance is much, much less than you expect and your load is much, much greater than you expect, at that critical juncture, that is where you get failure. And the code and our practice as engineers is all designed to make this zone of failure as small as possible. We can never eliminate it. We, you know, unless we want to design everything like every building, like the crazy bunker building I lined out earlier, we could. But even then, uh, even then, even if you design a crazy titanium bunker building, uh, I can always introduce one load that will ultimately um, cause it all to fail. And that, of course, is um, a load you don't see in the codes and that of course is meteor loading really big meteor loading at the end of the day if a kilometer wide meteor comes out of the sky and lands right on top of your building no matter how strong you make it no matter how uh you construct it that building is going bye-bye so uh anyway the point being we don't really design for meteor loading that's such a rare event it's really not worth worrying about because regardless of how we design our buildings if a great big rock falls on, on our head uh we're going to have a bad time so anyway, what we try to do is, for all of the reasonable loads that we would expect to have a structure to undergo in its lifespan, we try to uh, per to narrow the zone of failure to an acceptable value. And what that acceptable value is depends on innumerable things. Can sometimes it can depend on the, the needs of the client. Oftentimes, it'll depend on the type of structure. If it's something like the the self storage place, like I outlined earlier, that zone of failure is going gonna to be wider. If it's something like a hospital, it's going to be narrower. If it's something crazy important, like a nuclear power plant, that's going to be very, very small. Those things are designed to incredibly high. Uh, you, they, for those, they use very low um, resistance factors and very high load factors. Um, uh, and so they, and they also consider really crazy loadings like planes flying into them and things like that. Um, well, it was crazy before 9-11, unfortunately, but, uh, anyway, now it's, uh, not so crazy, but, uh, anyway, um, so they, so your, uh, acceptable zone of failure is going to be wider or narrower depending on both, on, depending mainly on your application. Another application where you'd have a very, very narrow acceptable zone of failure 
would be something like a very large dam. Uh, a small dam, you know, on a, a small river, something that's not carrying, holding back a massive amount of water. Eh, we don't want that to fail. It would flood a few houses if it did. Um, but some really massive dams. Imagine like the uh, Hoover Dam or uh, imagine the uh, Three Gorges Dam in China or the uh, the, uh, the Nasser, is Nasser High Dam, the one in Egypt. Uh, these massive nation-defining dams that are built to literally last, you know, centuries or eons or, you know, a dam like that, if properly maintained, might last or a thousand years or more if they properly maintain it. I mean, those dams, if those things ever fail, if that big dam in Egypt fails, oh my goodness, uh, oh boy, um, Egypt is gone, essentially. But uh, anyway, um, so those type of things, those type of th infrastructure projects that have, that if they fail, and there are some infrastructure projects like that, if they fail, you know, you're looking at casualties in the millions. And the on those type of things, the resistance factors you're going to use are incredibly small. You're you're figuring that on the worst case scenario, every member has half the capacity you assume to have. Maybe it's maybe the member is 100 years old or 500 years old and has lost half its strength due to corrosion, and maybe you multiply all your loads by three or something crazy like that. I don't know the exact. Uh, figures that go into those, but in those kind of things, you use crazy high load factors and crazy low resistance factors because those are things that simply cannot ever be allowed to fail. Because if they do, the you know the consequences are absolutely catastrophic on a national or even global level. But anyway, I hope you gain some appreciation for how the codes work. Um, this kind of statistical analysis, we don't. I'm not going to have you work through working through actual um, statistics or statistical analysis packages or whatever. Um, that kind of thing, but uh, I do. I just. I but I did just want to give you some appreciation for what kind of statistics and research goes in the type of codes and uh, and standards that we'll be applying all the way through the semester, and and as you work as practicing engineers uh, after you graduate. Okay, that'll do it for tonight. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.